Excellencies, honorable commissioner, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Killing in Nomad. Welcome and thank you for coming despite of that uh, bad weather. But well, it, it's not Killing in Nomad, it's Killing in Nomad in Estonian. Yeah, that's what I said. Welcome to Killing in Nomad. You can't speak Estonian. <laughs> Sorry, it's Killing in Nomad. <laughs> Well, I know. Maybe you won't try. Yeah, uh, that's why I'm so happy to have you here next to me and in <laughs> presence, not online. I'm very happy to see you too, of course. Thank you. I'm Valdis Melderis from uh, Latvia and uh, Tere Tallinn, Tere Estonia. So great to be here today on this very important day. Sveiki, Riga. Hello, Latvia. I'm Anu Velba from Estonia. Yeah. But. Um, you know? Sorry, what? I mean, can you feel it? Feel what? <laughs> Seriously, can you feel it? What are you talking about? I mean, between us. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> what should no, I feel? The, the, the spark, the electricity between us, Anu. Of course, yes, electricity. That's yeah. the reason why we are here. We are. Yeah. Th that's exactly the reason why we are here. <laughs> So, we are very happy uh, to welcome you all here to the opening ceremony of the third Estonia Latvia Electricity Interconnection. That's, I really love how it sounds. <laughs> welcome to the celebration of a new Estonian Latvian connection. Yes. And you know, this uh, new uh, Estonian Latvian connection will significantly contribute to improving the security of supply of the Baltics. And uh, today is the day when we will switch it on. We even have everything already ready, but we will also have a few speeches in between there. Yes, and let's talk a little bit about the organization of today's evening. Besides our well-honored uh, ministers and commissioner and specialists and responsibles, uh, who will uh, get to, uh, to greet. We have a uh, lunch buffet served uh, later on. Normally, uh, Latvians are comparing themselves to Estonians, and not always the score is favorable towards Latvia. But today, we have everything together and everything the best we can offer, like prime ministers, <laughs> musicians, and, and chefs. chefs. Exactly. And if we talk about the frame of this event, let's remember that it is an important step for connecting Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania to the power grid of continental Europe, so we are going even bigger. But today, I can feel it already. Yeah, electricity, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, the day will be great. Cannot agree with you more. And let us begin, then. Let's begin. And we are here very happy now to give the floor to the Estonian Prime Minister Kaja Kallas. Kaja Kallas, Eesti Peaminister Balun. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this uh, start sounded like a Eurovision Song Contest, <laughs> uh, but uh, is as exciting uh, this event um, as Eurovision. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today uh, and um, uh, also launch uh, the third Estonian-Latvian interconnection. Uh, as we all know, the new connection is part of the synchronization of the Baltic states with Central Europe. And even more importantly, integrating Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania with the internal in energy market of the uh, European Union. Uh, it's a symbol of energy security, connectivity and cross-border cooperation. Today's event demonstrates that synchronization is well on track and we remain committed to complete the project by the end of 2025. This would not be possible without the long-term support of the European Commission, so thank you for that. Um, and also uh, for all your efforts ensuring this success. I'm also happy to welcome the Prime Minister of Latvia with us to, uh, today. And uh, this is somewhat symbolic because in the European Parliament, uh, we work together both as members of, uh, of the European Parliament for this project uh, for many, many years. Synchronization is just one example of the long-standing energy cooperation between our co countries. 
Since last year, we are together with Finland part of the regional gas market uh, thanks to the Baltic Connector Pipeline. Almost one year ago, we agreed to cooperate for the purpose of developing a joint offshore wind farm by 2030. However, I'm convinced uh, that our ambition should not end here. In the European Union, we have agreed to raise our climate targets for 2030. And thanks to the Commission, we now have a roadmap to achieve those targets. This will mean further transformation of our energy production, transport, and also, to be honest, the entire economy. I am glad that in the offshore wind energy, we are already aiming to go higher and become regional leaders together. I'm convinced that our good regional cooperation and our success that Latvia and Estonia enjoyed um, will continue uh, to make us fit for cleaner future. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Yes, we will have a discussion later on. That's why uh, Prime Ministers and speakers are taking uh, place already in discussion corner. And by the way, I know, I guess um, the idea about the joint Latvian Estonian Eurovision is not so bad at all. <laughs> so next time we will win Eurovision again, we could ask you to join in then. But now, my ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Latvian Prime Minister, uh, Ministru Presidents Krišans Karinš. Thank you very much, uh, dear Kaya, uh, Commissioner Simpson, ladies and gentlemen. I really can't see anyone, but I assume there's ladies and gentlemen because I can hear you uh, somewhere behind all of the lights. It's uh, wonderful uh, to be here uh, in Estonia today. Uh, you're having just as nice weather as we're having, surprise. Uh, but uh, better, I suppose, some rain uh, than, uh, than some other uh, calamities, I suppose. But uh, I was just speaking with Kaya uh, as these two uh, saxophone players were doing a wonderful rendition of Potre, uh, that uh, our countries uh, have spent, if you count up the years, about 600 years in the same political entity, whatever it was called uh, at the time. So the, uh, the relationship and the roots uh, between our two countries are indeed deep uh, even if, uh, of course, we, we can barely understand one another except for a few words uh, in terms of our languages, but in terms of our culture uh, and political history, uh, we share uh, an incredible amount. Um, regarding energy, I think it's uh, symbolic, very important that this is a strengthening of the relation or the strength, strengthening of the electrical grid between our two countries. But this is, as Kaya mentioned, we've been working as European politicians on uh, the, uh, the European uh, energy market regulation and directive for, for many years together. And now we are both our uh, respective countries' prime ministers. And being here at the symbolic opening of the third interconnector between our two countries means a freer flow of electricity and a complete uh, integration of the three Baltic countries into a unified uh, electricity market, which will mean uh, also unified wholesale prices. Uh, we are currently uh, all uh, in the Nord Pool system, and the Latvian-Lithuanian border has been uh, one of the last bottlenecks. It's also vitally important, uh, this uh, third interconnector, regarding our planned uh, desynchronization or rejoining uh, the uh, synchronous grid uh, of the rest of Europe and uh, the free flow of electricity is extremely important uh, that our uh, uh, three countries uh, with uh, Lithuania uh, will be secure in terms of uh, energy supply after uh, the, the uh, cutting the links uh, with the third countries. And uh, thirdly, it's extremely important and meaningful, uh, this uh, interconnector, in making sure we have the needed infrastructure to build out more renewable energy. Uh, for the Baltics, for actually any uh, country, uh, renewable energy is absolutely the future, 
Uh, and it's also extremely important as a mitigator of price fluctuations. So right now in our countries and in, in throughout Europe, we're experiencing a surge in energy prices. The, the price of uh, oil, uh, uh, petroleum products, the price of natural gas is also hitting into the electricity markets. If we had more renewable energies, we would be more resilient to price fluctuations. Why? Because the wind never costs more or less. The sun never costs more or less. It always costs the same, nothing. Uh, you, you just need uh, the, the uh, installations to harness that uh, energy and to convert it into electricity. And uh, this will, of course, one of the concrete projects that both of our countries are working on is the, oh, there's no map of our countries anymore. Uh, the, the, the planned offshore uh, uh, wind uh, on, uh, near the border where Latvia and Estonia meet uh, on the Baltic Sea. So uh, I, I, I think it's extremely important and, and, and meaningful, uh, uh, this project, for all the reasons that I mentioned. And I'm extremely pleased uh, to be here and to meet with Kaya uh, in your uh, country. And I'm looking forward to uh, I suppose we'll be throwing these switches. They look a little dangerous, but I'm sure the electricians will tell us what to do, uh, maybe to do it with one hand, just in case. So thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you. And we are glad and happy to invite here uh, European Commissioner uh, for Energy, Europa Commission Energetica Volini, Kadri Simpson. Dear Prime Ministers, uh, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and uh, this is an honour and privilege to join you today here in Kilinginamme for the inauguration of the third electricity interconnection between Estonia and Latvia. A against a particular challenging context of the past year, I'm pleased to witness um, tangible results of how our trans-European networks for energy deliver some ground. Because uh, this third interconnector between Estonia and Latvia is a result of a successful, long-lasting cooperation in the region. Um, this is also a tool that helps create a strong interconnected energy market to the benefit of the Baltic citizens and businesses. And uh, this is something that is close to my home and to my heart. The connection is an important prerequisite for connecting Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania to the power grid of continental Europe. This is a priority of the three Baltic states and of the European Union. And the completion of the third interconnector confirms the steady pace of progress on the necessary investment uh, to achieve the synchronization of the Baltic states with the European networks by 2025. The new power line alleviates um, the congestion of the border between Estonia and Latvia. It also strengthens the grid and creates opportunities for connecting additional renewable capacity. And this is particularly important in view of the commitment um, of the three Baltic states to step up their cooperation on harnessing the offshore wind capacity. Um, the potential is huge here in the Baltic uh, region. And uh, the Baltic Sea offshore wind joint declaration of intent, as well as other initiatives in the region at political and technical level, uh, they set out an enabling framework for the identification of a pipeline of projects. Uh, the ambition on future offshore capacity requires a strong and robust grid to ensure that, that electricity flows uh, to where it is most needed. And to me, this project is much more than just another energy infrastructure investment, um, because it is labeled as project of common interest since 2013, and the European Commission has shown support at all levels for the third interconnection between Estonia and Latvia, and uh, the objectives it underpins. The implementation of cross-border energy infrastructure projects requires high political will and, of course, flexible decision-making with the involvement of many stakeholders and important coordination efforts. And I would like to 
take this opportunity to thank all of you for the continuous efforts uh, and support, uh, which often crossed jurisdictions and expertise, um, the efforts of hundreds of engineers, contractors, and um, representatives of national and uh, district and uh, local levels who all stand behind this successful completion of third interconnection. Thank you. So uh, let's get uh, very specific and uh, serious for some 20-ish minutes, I guess. We will focus on uh, energy now and uh, especially on economic cooperation and innovation side. Um, this will be a discussion with some three questions for each of you and they will be sometimes very specific. So I would begin uh, with one question for both of you Prime Ministers. And uh, people often see EU climate policy um, as a risk to the country's economic development. So people think like, well, that's expensive. Uh, it will be more expensive than before. And the question would be, if we look at EU's climate policy, not as a risk, but opportunity, as people usually would say, then what are the main business prospects or opportunities coming from EU climate policy for entrepreneurs in your country, in Estonia, in Latvia? So we would say, what is in there for me, for the business? Well, it's a, it's a good question. First of all, um, the green transition is definitely uh, addressing the value chain. So, so different parts of uh, economy where we talk about transport, agriculture, economy as a, as a wider, uh, wider prospect. So, so definitely uh, different areas there. Uh, Latvia and Estonia, we are small countries. So, so what we can do, we can develop uh, uh, that type of uh, innovative technologies that can be used for uh, different, uh, different aspects of this uh, uh, green transition. And definitely energy is something that we have to talk about. So how to be greener in that sense, how to trans uh, transform uh, the energy that we have, which is not that clean when we talk about oil shale, into something more greener. And, and there definitely I see a great um, uh, uh, great um, opportunity in, in uh, building these uh, wind farms uh, that we do in, uh, together with, uh, with Latvia. So not only our mutual project, but also developing the uh, offshore grid, because if you have different offshore uh, wind parks uh, that um, deliver a lot of energy, how can they be transported to uh, different countries as well? And, and we uh, can be leaders here to, to uh, sort of pull the others uh, from, uh, from other countries uh, around the Baltic um, uh, Sea as well. So Estonia once again would be the one to show and lead the way in some uh, sort? Well, we're together with Latvia, so, so we are already cooperating on this uh, one project and we can definitely uh, cooperate on, on building this uh, grid and also um, convincing the others around the Baltic Sea that it's necessary because when we talk about the electricity market or energy market of the European Union, then it can't work when we don't have connections. And therefore, the connections between our countries and between those big offshore wind parks are necessary so that the energy or electricity can actually flow to any country that needs the electricity at the moment. In Latvia, people are not only mentioning the economic risks, but sometimes they feel like they are, their well-being is, is threatened, for example, by wind parks. And they say, yeah, good idea, not on my soul, uh, soil. So question would be also for the Latvian parts, uh, what would be the benefits uh, of these uh, EU policies in Latvia? Well, the uh, EU policy, what many people don't realize is that it is certainty for business. So we have a European market of 450 million, and we have EU policy which says, if you can solve 
building renewable energy, providing solutions for, re for energy efficiency, uh, clever technologies to control uh, systems, to uh, control uh, uh, energy savings within uh, companies and, and manufacturing, you will earn money. And there's nothing better for business than to know that there is a guaranteed demand, which is guaranteed with the force of law. Everyone has to reduce their emissions, so the clever people who can help them will make lots of money. And in, 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 in our country, I have uh, 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 spoken, I have not visited, I have spoken with a company who is providing a service to offshore wind farms of not only cleaning the blades, but coating them with something that makes them some 15% more efficient. Uh, these are clever people. They figured out how, you know, so the, the Danes were clever, they made the big turbine. And then the clever Latvians come and say, well, if you want it more efficient, then take our coating and we know how to apply it. And it, uh, there, are, there are systems uh, to be applied, uh, control systems, uh, that's a lot of software, it's software intensive, where our countries excel, uh, on controlling um, mm, energy systems within a company. Say there's a manufacturing plant, it has countless little uh, turbines and, and things that move. Everything that moves requires energy. So to make that more efficient and a, a more efficient use of it, not of, uh, of course, there's also, um, we know that in electric transportation, there's plenty of room uh, for small companies to make improvements. So it was a number of years ago, uh, uh, the, the fastest, uh, it was maybe four or five years ago, the fastest electoral automobile, and the, there's this race in the United States called the Klondike something, was by a small company in Latvia that simply figured out how to get more power out of the same amount of electricity. And they're working with now uh, some uh, European uh, big manufacturers uh, to uh, have these, uh, the technology and know-how. So our countries are relatively small, our companies are relatively small, but with these new and emerging technologies, small is often better because you're more nimble. You're not set in doing things the way that your grandfather did it. Mm -hmm. You're looking at it open-eyed and it's one heck of an opportunity that European law guarantees. Yeah. Gaia? Just, uh, just one uh, addition, I think, uh, when we talk about digital transformation, then there are you know, big players uh, on the market when we talk about Google or Facebook, but, but there are no big players uh, in, the, in the climate uh, uh, change economy or the green economy. So, so there's a lot of opportunities, as, as Christiane said, a uh, lot of opportunities for small companies, clever companies, which uh, our countries definitely represent. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, next one would be um, a little wider and maybe deeper and more specific for um, Commissioner. Uh, the amount of dispatchable generation units uh, is decreasing and the share of renewables is increasing. The uh, adds another layer of compl complexity to ensuring the security of supply. So, furthermore, we have recently seen a decline in mutual trust among European countries during COVID crisis. So, suddenly there was a feeling that there is no European Union. Each state was fighting alone and sometimes really competing to other states and it's still a trend. So, a trend can be seen where implemented security of supply measures are more and more country specific, uh, which makes uh, them more expensive, especially for smaller countries. And the question would be this. What would be the measures based on the pan-European uh, framework of platform that would ensure the unity and trust between countries in Europe, ensuring the security of supply together, like we are doing here today? So how to make sure that the cross-border energy trade will not have similar interruptions during the next crisis as we saw with other goods? Because, like I said, it was suddenly everyone was on its own. Well, the lessons learned from the previous COVID crisis uh, is indeed that uh, for a moment, some member states decided to take unilateral actions um, to close the borders. But uh, electricity market and energy market overall showed a very strong resilience because uh, preparedness was good uh, and all the risk, risks were um, taken into account already before, before this kind of crisis started. So despite the um, uh, COVID measures, 
we didn't saw any disruptions in our uh, energy markets. Uh, but of course, for us to achieve our climate targets, both for 2030 and 2050, we need well-functioning um, 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 regional markets because um, integrated energy markets will accommodate more renewables. And only by doing that, we will, uh, we will decarbonize our energy market. Um, at the EU level, we have ado adopted several um, uh, regulations that will help member states um, to organize their good cooperation. Well, um, mentioning some of them, risk preparedness, um, also unbundling, and, uh, and uh, of course, EU-wide market coupling um, um, is, is a key. And, um, and um, during the past 10 years, we have negotiated um, this legal framework. Um, Baltic states and uh, Nordics, uh, they are a very good example how regional market can operate. Um, from EU financing perspective, we are supporting uh, interconnections. We just negotiated with uh, ministers uh, the new regulation for trans-European energy networks that will also um, cover in the future um, cooperation between member states uh, in, uh, in offshore projects. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I think that uh, regional cooperation, cooperation is key. So are you saying that commissions have learned from previous crises? Well, at the energy market perspective, we, uh, we were prepared. So, uh, of course, uh, we, we need to take uh, into account what happened. Uh, but even in the, um, in the moments when, uh, when there were very strong lockdown measures, um, the, well, the risk of uh, um, disruptions, for example, in nuclear power plants was taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, um, member states who, who took um, uh, measures to, to avoid um, tourists, for example, they made green corridors for essential workers so that all the greed, uh, um, um, well, um, well, all the technical personnel were able to travel. That's, that's uh, quite a good news. So we have experience on that. Kaya. Uh, yes, I just wanted to add, uh, there is a risk for this um, national protectionism. We have seen this in the health crisis. You know, one is the agreements we have on paper, and the other is when there is real crisis, how, how member states really act. And, and therefore, I think building this resilience for the energy market to work when we have energy crisis, because the, the um, uh, there is a strong will in, in some member states to close up when there is crisis inside the country, and this is totally understandable. So, but it might hurt the others. So, if we have built our uh, energy system um, so that uh, that we are also sort of dependent on the connections that we have with other member states, then uh, you know it might be uh, detrimental to you know one of the. Uh, one of the member states, if somebody else closes up, and therefore definitely we have to have these um, um, safeguards in place. But so are you saying that this inter interconnection is some kind of leverage for uh, the separate countries? The more we have the interconnectors, uh, the more the uh, market is connected and the more we can benefit from uh, energy resources in other, uh, other member states and, and the more uh, member states also feel that we are dependent on each other. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if we just have uh, the uh, energy production within our country and, and uh, we are the ones or one member state is, is dependent on the others, then it's very easy to close the one uh, out. But I hope it's it's not happening, and I don't want to be the fear monger here, but, uh, but it's just that we have to keep this in mind. Thank you. And next question is also to you. Um, and you already mentioned Baltic Sea Offshore Grids, and there is a Baltic Sea Offshore Grid initiative led by Ellering. As many studies have been shown, large-scale offshore wind combined with an offshore uh, grid is the cheapest and fastest way to achieve climate targets, although some people are saying without atomic energy we are not uh, reaching them, we have to go that way. 
We'll touch that a little later. But the question is, what can governments do to support TSO's initiative to develop Baltic Sea wind potential to move towards decarbonized economy faster and cheaper for all nations? Because, yes, that's the way to go. But how do we get there? There was mentioned already some uh, slight little things. We can uh, do it more efficiently, well, by cleaning blades, for example. But the big moves by governments. Uh, I think one is what I already mentioned is that not only we need the offshore wind parks, but we also need the grid between those uh, parks so that we can benefit from, uh, from those offshore wind parks. But the other thing, what is very important uh, on, on a national level, and I think it's common for every country, it is that uh, people are more reluctant of having those parks uh, uh, within their region. So um, in Estonia, we have been sort of lucky uh, that our uh, energy production or electricity production is just in one, one region, but, uh, but it has to be allocated everywhere. And, and so people uh, are saying that, yes, this is very fine, but not in my backyard. Uh, and therefore, we ha are developing this uh, uh, regional uh, benefit component so that uh, how can the locals benefit from uh, those big uh, renewable energy parks uh, so that they can say, okay, that's, uh, uh, you know, your question, what's in it for us? So you're yeah, going, and there's a clear you're answer. Go, you're going <laughs> some kind of buy the locals so they agree to take part well, in it? Uh, well, uh, it's uh, sort of thank you maybe to the locals, but, but anyway, to connect the locals to those uh, to those big uh, parks so that they can understand not only that we are part of the bigger picture, but also it's beneficial to us as a community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Latvian Prime Minister, Christian Skarinsch, uh, will have to probably answer one of the most touchy subjects. I'm just warning you. The Baltic States plan to join the continental European electricity system in 2026. So taking into account increasing energy security concerns in the light of opening Ostrovets nuclear power plant, uh, should we desynchronize faster from the Russian grid? Uh, or what should we do to mitigate risks of uh, unplanned sudden desynchronization? Because we know things are quite unpredictable with some partners. Well, first, uh, we have to realize that the bigger threat is that Russia could cut us off before we are ready. Mm. Uh, so uh, we have to realize this, that they have uh, invested in the infrastructure where uh, their grid uh, holds up if we are cut off. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, our system operator, as I'm sure the Estonian and uh, the Lithuanian uh, system operators, uh, uh, are interested in doing this sooner rather than later. But uh, as a politician, I think that uh, Kai and I would be happy to say that, t you know, we'll, we'll throw that switch and what the hell will be desynchronized and, and living in a wonderful tomorrow. But uh, there are very real practical considerations uh, that uh, the, uh, the grid has to be ready. And this is one important step today. Uh, the third uh, interconnector between uh, Latvia and uh, Estonia is a vital part of the desynchronization process. Uh, so, but you have to go step by step. The steps are all planned. Uh, and if it could be done uh, sooner and it really is prepared, there would be only political support for such a decision. But you cannot... Uh, polit politics cannot, not, cannot run ahead of physics. They both have to be there. But it's kind of uh, catch-22. So which one would come or should come first? Readiness to disconnect or uh, and until then we have to have good enough relationships on this uh, field. So if we are getting ready, that could uh, look uh, bad maybe from the other side. Uh, Look, if uh, we could, uh, I understand in speaking with the, the people who understand the physics of electrical grids, uh, we can be, already today, uh, we could survive uh, without the uh, synchronization coming from Russia. It would simply cost us a lot more. Mm -hmm. So it would drive up consumer uh, costs uh, because of the grid operators we would have to um, uh, have, for example, so maintaining the 50 hertz uh, frequency 
uh, is done by turning on and turning off uh, generation capacity. And the easiest way to do that is through gas turbines. Gas turbines, we know that the cost of gas is going up. If these uh, turbines have to be shut in, shut out, mm -hmm. say in the summer when you're not getting the benefit of the heat uh, and you're just blowing it up into the air, it's going to cost us a lot more. So it's, it's a question of realistic uh, costs as well. We could do it, but mm -hmm. actually want to do it so that our businesses and consumers don't feel a shock. And that's where the plan is, and there's still some infrastructure development needed to make it really work well. All right, thank you. Uh, question to Commissioner. Let's go back to the issues related to the Baltic Sea offshore grid we mentioned. So what are the specific steps and the initiatives of the, or incentives of the European Commission to help implement the Baltic Sea offshore grid project from the European side? Well, <clears throat> just a very short comment on synchronization because it is also a uh, top priority for the Commission, both politically and financially. Yeah. For example, last year when we had the uh, last CEF call, uh, the total volume was 900 million euros. 700 of this was dedicated to Baltic synchronization so that um, you will be ready by 2025 to desynchronize. But on offshore, we just adopted last year a dedicated offshore strategy that addresses all five EU sea basins. And not all of those uh, don't have such a good uh, shallow coastal waters like uh, Baltic Sea region does. Um, but um, but we, we will have a solutions for all of those. Um, the, uh, offshore wind doesn't have to come from bottom fixed offshore box, but you can also use new technologies. Um, right now the leadership uh, is um, coming from North Sea Basin. We can learn from their um, experience. And, and um, what we also see here is that you need a very good regional cooperation. We do expect that, uh, that uh, waste uh, that offshore wind has a waste potential because the best spots in mainland are, are already taken. But in offshore, uh, you, can, you can scale up the production. Of course, you have to take uh, care uh, the concerns of the uh, other economic activities. But, uh, but uh, there is a possibility for, uh, uh, for, um, um, for different sectors to, uh, to use the same territory. And, uh, and the first step that we did after we adopted our offshore strategy was this summer when we achieved agreement with uh, member states on um, trans-European energy networks. And now when the dialogues will be, um, uh, will be finalized, we can start uh, also supporting financially the um, uh, offshore projects and, uh, and the investments that you need to do um, to connect offshore wind farms with uh, mainland. So are you saying that if we talk about offshore, then it doesn't always mean the stick with the pro propellers. There's, there's some other uh, innovations already on the way. So it would be easier to talk with all uh, involved parties. Yes, of course, there are those solutions, uh, but they are not well economically uh, competitive yet. But uh, there is floating wind, there are, um, uh, there are tidal and wave energy, which is a um, very, very interesting solution for Atlantic, for mm -hmm. example. And, uh, and of course, we are taking care also about the visual effects, because as, uh, as it was mentioned earlier, uh, there are people who are worried what will happen with their beautiful landscape or, or uh, what will, how they will see their uh, sunset. Uh, when, uh, when uh, all those ambitious plans are, um, uh, are, when hap they, uh, mm, are mm, fulfilled. visualizing, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so, uh, so, um, so it means um, maybe we will one day will be used to the flickering sun uh, sunset, for example, and that would be a norm, like Eiffel Tower became a norm, although people hated it at the beginning. Um, w last three questions. Each of you won. Uh, Kaya, fossil versus renewables is uh, the topic these days, and you already mentioned one part of it. Uh, do we have enough uh, knowledge and know-how to replace fossil fuels, for example, oil shale uh, in Estonia, uh, with 100 renewable sources, and what would be the timetable if that would happen? 
Uh, well, uh, oil shale is uh, one of the most uh, polluting uh, energy uh, resources, so, so we try to phase out, and, and we have a timetable of, uh, of uh, 2040 to do that, so, so this is agreed uh, in our government. Uh, if the question is whether renewables replace that, uh, probably not entirely, but if we have offshore wind, uh, which is uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a big scale, then it is uh, much easier and it's also more reliable uh, than onshore wind. Uh, then uh, you have different uh, resources. But I think in terms of Estonia, it is uh, important that we have uh, good connections with, uh, with other countries, first of all. Then second, that we have a diversity of uh, energy resources uh, so that we don't put all the eggs in, the, in, uh, in one basket. And, and then we can diversify also uh, to phase out the oil shale. And we have plans how to do that. Uh, what is about the sentiment of uh, the population? Are they really saying, ah, oh, just keep on digging, it's cheaper? Well, of course, it depends. Uh, when you talk, of, uh, talk to people in the eastern part of Estonia, the, who are used to, and there are a lot of miners and, and energy uh, workers, uh, I, I had a very good meeting with the trade union, and, and I figured that actually we are not that far apart. Uh, uh, we both have the same worry. They are worried uh, that uh, whether they have um, jobs in the future, and we are also worried about that we, because we don't want to have a you know socio economical problem in eastern part of Estonia where we have a huge uh, Russian minority. So we are both working on that, and and people there they understand that uh, they can see the world, and and also that Estonia is part of the world, it's part of Europe. So they see the trends, and and not exactly. Five fighting against this as a, as a small island, but, but also seeing the opportunities. And we as a government, we of course work to invite investments that would replace uh, the kind of industry that is there, because there are very hardworking people with very specific skills, and we need to have the same kind of industry to replace that, and plus renewables to replace the uh, energy that comes from oil shale. All right, thank you. Um, Christian Skarinch. So let's talk about uh, prices of uh, uh, the energy markets and the Green Deal. This is not exactly the best time to present Green Deal, which probably would make sometimes the energy uh, more expensive. Uh, so how to achieve the acceptance of the Green Deal by the citizen in the light of increasing energy prices right now? Well, ironically, uh, right now, at least in Latvia, uh, the Green Deal probably sounds very sweet because uh, oil uh, uh, and gas prices are going up very high. Consumers are now uh, facing uh, uh, much higher energy prices. And uh, if uh, they had, uh, say, on their south-facing roof, uh, home uh, electricity production, uh, they would be smiling a little bit because uh, they, you know, you can sell into the grid, you take out of the grid, and you only pay the difference. Um, uh, uh, thinking also the discussion we're having about the, about the wind farms and the acceptance. Uh, when I was last in uh, Denmark uh, uh, with the prime minister there, uh, we also, I, I spoke uh, with uh, uh, the people who are in the business of creating such energy sources and, and about the acceptance, I asked them. And they, and they said in Denmark they've tried many ways to do it but actually um, working with farmers uh, in a general vicinity, so, I don't know, three kilometers away, uh, two kilometer and one kilometer away, there are different um, um, schemes of, of support or getting them interested, and they say that, so it's one thing if you're a farmer and, and on the horizon, just coming above the pines, there's a turning blade and you're thinking, it looks awful, but if you're making money off of that turning blade, you will be upset, why is it not turning <laughs> today? You, you want it to turn. So you can, you can have clever ways to get people interested into that, but uh, uh, energy uh, costs and the costs of fossil fuels will only be going up. Mm -hmm. Also because in Europe and around the world, the, the, uh, the price of carbon emissions will inevitably be going up. So when Kai and I were working on the electricity market uh, uh, the the uh, regulation and the directive, I remember the, the price of carbon was something under five euros. 
Uh, now it is, I have not looked uh, lately, but it was over 30 euros. So the only thing we should have done is invested in ETFs that trace this, and we could be both uh, mm -hmm. uh, very wealthy right now. But uh, what it means is that for energy producers, the cost of polluting will become ever more in a, real, in a very real sense. And uh, renewables don't have that. And when you realize that, uh, profoundly speaking, the wind and the sun is free, it, you only have to make the upfront investment to harness the energy. Um, but it, it, it's a process. Uh, certainly in my country right now, most people, uh, when they think of um, uh, the Green Deal, they think, so what does that mean? The cost of diesel will be higher. Um, and there's great resistance. Uh, but uh, that, that, that is something to be overcome uh, with time. It, mm -hmm. you, you cannot just magic wand it away. It's something that we need to work with. And certainly the younger generation in, in my country, I assume it's in Estonia, they, to them, climate change is, is an existential issue. So when I was a child, it was the threat of nuclear war. Uh, for my children, it's the threat of the world overheating or, or calamitous uh, weather. They feel that as, a, as an existential threat. So for, for the younger generation, there's not going to be a problem of acceptance and renewable energy, I think, is, is a given. Mm -hmm. But it's for getting the, uh, the generations closer to my own, uh, shall we say. So what I'm hearing is that there is a sentiment for a better world, also in public, even if they, that for a while or for a short investment period will cost more. Uh, and the Green Deal sounds good in these circumstances, right? Hmm. Uh, commissioner, specific skills and knowledge, uh, of course, needed to move towards carbon neutral economy. And still, most of the people, I guess, who really don't know the nuances uh, feel that as a threat because there are so many things they will have to change. Uh, then what would be the best way that the Baltic states could contribute to the carbon neutral economy in the whole of Europe? Sometimes we feel like, yeah, just let's get something from Europe, but let's think how we can contribute. Uh, what would be our, our main strengths and opportunities? The Baltic States. When we presented our Green Deal, when we presented it as a growth strategy. And we have to keep in mind that, well, it depends on the, on the um, uh, wholesale prices, but, uh, but um, a couple of years ago, EU27 imported um, crude oil and natural gas, which was worth of annually 300 billion euros. And some of it we will replace with renewables so that we are producing here. Uh, that means that it creates a lot of jobs. And of course, uh, that means that we need people who have new skills. It means um, reskilling and upscaling workforce. And, um, and it means that new innovative um, solutions will find a very fast-growing market. And in this regard, Baltic states um, have experience how to, um, um, how to offer handmade, tailor-made solutions uh, that, will, uh, that will fit for, uh, for Europe and the rest of the world. For example, for offshore wind technology, Europe still keeps the global leadership, and we are doing our best to keep this production here in Europe. Um, so that value chain will, um, will, that all the member states will benefit, even the ones who don't have coastal uh, territories. Um, also solar, it is not only uh, solar panels, uh, as we use to know uh, the solar, uh, solar um, uh, PVs, but it is already roof tiles that, uh, that look beautiful, that, uh, that are smart, uh, uh, and um, that need... Um, also uh, IT solutions uh, to, to, um, to make them work. So, let us be needed there, so uh, Europe can't do that without uh, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. And um, Excellencies, Honourable Commissioner, thank you very much for this discussion. In a few minutes, we will ask you back on the stage, on that side, to those switches, to do the job. Thank <laughs> you for the discussion. Round of applause. Thank you, and we will move on. We continue with a video greeting uh, from uh, European Climate Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency. Please, the screen is yours. 
dear Prime Ministers, dear Commissioner, dear beneficiaries, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be with you today to celebrate the official opening of the third electricity interconnection between Estonia and Latvia. I am thrilled to see how the Connecting Europe facility contributes to the implementation of this project with strategic importance for the whole Baltic region. The Connecting Europe facility has contributed 112 million euro to this project. It will provide clear benefits to the Baltic region by increasing the security of supply and by further developing the electricity market. It will also improve the integration possibilities of renewable sources in Estonia and Latvia. And this is so important in the context of the European Green Deal and the Fit for 55 package. Beside this interconnector, a number of energy infrastructure developments are currently underway in Estonia and Latvia. I am proud to note that my agency, Sinea, supports many of those projects. So far, since 2014, the projects of common interest in Estonia and Latvia have received a total of 653 million euro in SEF funding. And this will increase further, as the European Union is funding the synchronization project in the Baltic States and Poland. It is amongst the largest energy infrastructure projects under the Connecting Europe facility with a total of 1.2 billion euro EU support. We are pleased to launch in early September the first call of proposals under the new multi-annual financial framework with a budget of 5.8 billion euro. So stay tuned on our website. For us at CINEA, it is a great pleasure to work with the Estonian and Latvian beneficiaries. Ellering and AST always aim to deliver to the highest quality and professionalism. I would like to congratulate you for the stellar management of this project, where you kept the budget as close as possible to the estimated one. We also appreciate that you respect deadlines and are always available for updates. Implementation of large cross-border energy infrastructure projects requires the involvement of many stakeholders. Coordination amongst the beneficiaries is extremely important. Political support by the member states from national to local level is key. We highly appreciate the teamwork efforts of all the engineers, contractors and workers. I would like to thank you all for the work done. We are here together to witness EU energy policy happening on the ground. On behalf of all of us at CINEA, we look forward to a continued and fruitful cooperation with you. May the ongoing and future projects continue to be a success and help establish the energy union for our citizens and businesses. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's a little bit chilly here, but it gets warmer. As uh, I ask on the stage, Tavi Westmeg, a man with a warm heart, uh, CEO of Ellering. <laughs> Ellering, you have to say to Thank you very much, Sanu. Uh, dear Prime Ministers, uh, Commissioner Simpson, dear Minister Aas, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. The mission of my company, Ellering, is uh, to keep lights on and the homes heated. And I should really apologize. This is not my home and this is off-grid installation. And you see, this is not so warm today. But if you are connected with our grid, uh, your home's definitely heated and lights on always. Um, and we believe, based on all that, that the best way to do this is uh, to have an integrated, well-functioning single European energy market. A fully integrated Estonian-Latvian energy market, together with the infrastructure, has been an integral part of our vision, from electricity to gas, from wholesale to retail. We in Ellering strongly believe that synchronization, Estonia and Latvia, with the continental Europe power system by 2026, and maintain reliable electricity supply in transition, are strategically crucial steps to ensure security of supply to Estonian citizens. This is the higher purpose 
of why we are doing all this. We are not just building lines between countries with our friends from Augsburg and Matikles, but our vision is to ensure security of supply in a climate-neutral way and at the same time support the competitiveness of the Estonian economy. The third Estonian-Latvian interconnector contributes to all three aspects of our vision. First, to ensure security of supply of our customers. Strongly interconnected greed is ultimate precondition for security of supply. Second, to help us to do it in a climate-neutral way. Strong interconnector alongside Riga's Gulf is preconditioned for interconnecting onshore and in the future even more offshore wind from the Baltic Sea. And third, to contribute to our country's economic competitiveness. Our power generation companies may produce more energy from renewable energy sources and help to build strong decarbonized energy production portfolios of our countries. Ladies and gentlemen, therefore, the broader view, like the Baltic Energy Market Interconnection Plan, is important. PEMIP has been a success story in European range. We wouldn't have all these electricity and gas interconnectors together with the energy market without PEMIP. PEMIP helped us many times to overcome our national interest to the broader regional vision. I would hereby like to thank the European Commission and above all DG Energy for their patience in leading the PEMIP process all these years, continuously. Many significant changes are still coming. But most importantly, for trusting the 60 5% co-financing grant from the Connecting Europe facility to the Estonian-Latvian interconnector. I would like to thank all parties who contributed to the project in addition to my friends and colleagues from ASD and Ellering. They are our contractors, local governments, state authorities, diplomats, policy makers, European Commission, TG Energy and many others. Many thanks all of you. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the European TSO community, I say we keep our promises and synchronize Baltic power system in continental Europe uh, at latest at the end of uh, 2025. Third, Estonian Latvian electricity interconnector is ultimate precondition for this. I'd like to wish long live to Estonian third interconnector. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, please welcome the chairperson of Augsburg Matikos in Latvia, uh, Augsburg Matikos Valdes Priekšsēdētāja, Gunta Jakobson. Welcome. Honorable Prime Minister Kallas, Honorable uh, Prime Minister Karinš, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, Partners and employees, ļoti cienījumā Kallas Sekunde, augstgodātais Kariņa kungs, dārgie viesi, Tere Estonia. The new Estonian-Latvian power inter interconnection is a significant step to improve power supply safety in the region. New electricity consumers and producers will be enabled to access the transition network. The main uh, the new main line between Estonia and Latvia significantly improves transmission capacity and provides more effective electricity market. Henry Ford, the giant of the car industry, once said, coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. This, pro this project is an excellent example of the progress and success achieved jointly by AST and Ellering employees. In cooperation with constructors, considering the highest requirements of the construction quality and supply security. An interesting fact is we actually we counted from Latvia's side, approximately 350 people were, were working on the project 
I would assume same amount from Estonia, so meaning close to the thousand people, and that was really great cooperation. Free movement of goods and services in the European Union it is the one of the, uh, its main conditions. The commissioning this in interconnection removes the technical restrictions uh, of electricity flows. And now, preconditions for the construction of new power plants are in place. I really believe that the successful operation of this interconnection and continued common work of AST and Ellering experts to provide it will be a sufficient basis for new renewable energy power plants in Latvia and Estonia. With this, we will be able to achieve the European Green Energy Goals. Thank you. Thank you. Gunta, please stay, because we Thank will you. need you all. So, we are very glad to call out the symbolic launch of the Estonia-Latvia interconnection. This is the third interconnection we are celebrating, and um, I guess we can do it all together. Yeah, Prime Minister Skaja Kallas. Um, Leibnokti Premier Ministry. Also, Kadri Simson. Tavi Veskimägi. Und Gunta. Uh, please uh, take uh, uh, your places behind the switches so we can take a little photo moment before we begin. But we could do it all together. <laughs> We could do it all together. This is a third connection, so we will be counting all together from one to three. And on three, it will happen. What is important? Estonian guests will do it in Estonian, and Latvian guests will do it in Latvian. So if you were going to do it in Latvian, it would be Viens Divi Tris. But, of course, let's have a video on the, on the screen and let's get ready. Wait. So it will be done on three. And let's count us all together. You count in Estonian or Latvian and let's do it together. Uh, so yeah, let's please put your hands on so everyone is joining in. And let us begin from one and then on three it will be switched on. And yes, you push forward. We are pushing forward together. So let's count. Viens, Divi, Tris. It is on! Congratulations! On the internet stays there forever. This is a very historic moment. And I have to ask you, Arno, what yes. Estonians are doing in historic moments like this? You mean historic moment like the opening of uh, electricity interconnection? Yeah. Estonians would definitely invite some close friends for a meal to maybe listen and play some brilliant music and of course raise glasses to 
cherish the moment. So uh, I guess you just uh, copied that from Latvians because that's what we do too. <laughs> or you copied us. <laughs> anyway. So, yes. Thank uh, you. You can leave, of course, uh, the stage. Woo! Thank you. And um, let's uh, celebration to begin. So, my ladies and gentlemen, uh, we would do exactly the same. We would celebrate with some more music from uh, Denis Vashkevich from Latvia. And from Estonia. And you are welcome to enjoy our lovely lunch buffet. Yep. By the way, which is made by both on this side, uh, is by Estonian chefs, uh, Mikkel Galbus and Ragnar Bamberg. And on that side, please welcome to enjoy uh, Mars Jansson's um, um, cuisine. And you can uh, taste some Latvian uh, chef's work there. And of course, enjoy some saxophone music. Yes, yeah, saxophone music from Estonian and Latvian musician Tima Imla. And let's stay connected. It works. Thank you. Thank you, and long live to electricity interconnection. Woo. So.